Welcome everyone to the Coalition for Marriage YouTube channel. If you're joining us for the first time, let me just mention again that we are the UK's largest pro-marriage organisation. We represent groups and individuals who support one man, one woman marriage. And that's not to say other things don't exist in a uh, liberal democracy, but we think one man, one woman, lifelong monogamous marriage has special, unique value to society. And I'm really excited to welcome today's guest who's going to talk to us about that and, and uh, why it's so important. Uh, Kirk Durston, would you like to say hello to our listeners? Yes, well, it's a pleasure to be here, Tony, and a uh, big hello to everybody who is watching this video or listening to it. Can I just say, folks, as well, uh, if you're listening to this and you think it's useful, could you please forward it to family members, to colleagues, to friends? Uh, what we're discussing today is perhaps one of the most pivotal things we've discussed so far. And the more people that know about this, the better. Now, Kirk, you're going to talk to us about the uh, writings of a 20th century social anthropologist, Oxford social anthropologist J.D. Unwin, because he's got a lot to say about society, about the things that matter to society in terms of whether it prospers or whether in fact that society collapses. Uh, first of all, Kirk, tell us a little bit about yourself and how maybe you came on to the study of Unwin. Sure. Uh, I grew up in central Canada on a farm uh, raising beef and grain. Uh, but uh, I guess at the age of 17 or 18, I decided I needed a vacation. So I went off to university and uh, did a couple of undergraduate degrees there, one in physics, one in engineering. And uh, then uh, for, upon completion, I moved to Montreal and worked for Pratt & Whitney as experimental test engineer. And during that time, I uh, met and married the woman now that I've been married to for, let's see, it's four, it'll be 42 years this this July. And uh, yeah, well, it's been, it just gets, uh, yeah, I'm very thankful and grateful for her. And uh, then uh, I found working with uh, high tech uh, very interesting, but not near as interesting as people. And so uh, I began to feel motivated to start working more with people. And uh, I left um, after a couple of years of looking at different opportunities. Uh, I left that and began to work with people, particularly university students on universities across Canada. And eventually I began to, um, to speak on issues at universities and not just in Canada, but a little bit in the US and actually a few, uh, several times in Scotland, once in the UK and a little bit in Europe. But as I interacted with university students, I saw there were two major problems that seemed to devastate them or set them back. And uh, as a result, that's where I did graduate degrees, one in philosophy, which was a master's, uh, not a doctorate, but then a doctorate in biophysics uh, for reasons that it would equip me to be better, to better interact with the particular issues that university students were raising. And uh, yeah, so along the way, I, I've always been interested because I have, I've been, I was raised in a fairly um, what would you say? Well, I don't think the word strict is particularly appropriate, but with, with high moral values when it comes to what we do with our sexuality. But I was always interested in what if people don't, don't live by those values? Like, what is the difference? How does that affect them? And um, so when I, when I heard about J.D. Unwin's work back in the 1930s, uh, I became very interested in it. I went through that book a couple of times, created a summary, and uh, published it on my website. And I think the day I published it, there was a, a professor at Princeton, uh, Robert P. George, who is internationally distinguished professor, who has, I guess, taught on on one. And he, has, he was showing my article, and he actually endorsed it, said this was a, a very good treatment of Unwin. But he went on to say... <clears throat> that um, although Unwin published in the 1930s his book, um, Sex and Culture, no one since then has surpassed or even re reached the same level of research as J.D. Unwin did. He studied 86 different cultures and civilizations to see what the relationship was between flourishing of those civilizations in terms of architecture, art, agriculture, and uh, literature. Uh, 
between that and the sexual constraints they exercised. And when he did that, he found some truly remarkable observations that he said were consistent and repeat with, and I quote, monotonous irregularity. But the beauty of him having published in, in the mid 1930s is that he published before our own sexual revolution in Western society. So what that enables us to do is enables us to look at Unwin, his research, what the consequences are of loosening sexual constraints, what the predictions his research made, and then look at to see, to test actually, to test the validity of his conclusions and observations by looking at whether our own society is following the same footsteps with, and I quote, monotonous regularity, and it turns out it is astoundingly so. So if I can summarize what, 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 what I interpret as Unwin's thesis is, is essentially, um, once a society uh, drops the notion of one man, one woman, monogamous lifetime relationships, and added to that, um, keeping sex for that one man, one woman, uh, monogamous relationship, once society lets go of that, it marks the demise of the culture. Um, is, is that largely a, a summary of his analysis of 86 cultures um, over time? Well, it's actually, uh, the, let's talk about the tipping point, the tipping point between a culture ascending this curve of flourishing and well-being, yep. that reaching the tipping point of sexual um, freedom or the relaxing of sexual constraints and then the deterioration. What he found is that the tipping point <clears throat> actually occurred before the abandonment of what he called absolute monog or absolute monogamy. Absolute monogamy, defined by Unwin, is the uh, one man, one woman for life. Uh, mm -hmm. And that means, that includes specifically their sexual relationship is only between those two, the man and the woman for life. That was absolute monogamy. But the tipping point occurred in a culture before that. The tipping point occurred when prenuptial chastity was no longer required. That is, uh, he called it prenuptial because he was referring to many different civilizations that didn't use the term marriage necessarily. They had all sorts of customs for marriage that we would translate as marriage, but he used the term nuptial. So when sex before marriage became acceptable in a culture, that was the tipping point. And three things happened, one of which after that would be the loss of absolute monogamy. Once prenuptial chastity was abandoned, then that affected marriages because marriages, uh, uh, lifelong marriages between a man and a woman mm. uh, became, well, basically began to um, be replaced with serial relationships. And that's uh, pretty much where our culture is today as far as the middle age to older mm. people now <clears throat> would be, well, especially the middle age, there'd be serial relationships, but that is rapidly being degenerating even further in Western culture amongst the younger people to what we might call complete sexual freedom. Mm. Now that is devastating to a culture. I know that people get excited about sexual freedom, but they are unaware, totally unaware of what the long-term consequences of that are. And J.D. Unwin nailed that down. It is the collapse of that culture within three generations which he defined as roughly one century a hundred years so when he, when he's looking at that um that collapse of the culture or, or what tends to be lost from the culture he refers to something uh th this notion of energy doesn't he which is yeah. uh, reason reflection and creation and it's almost like or is it almost like you tell me it's like once people start thinking about who they can have sex with and who they what their own sexual desires are they stop thinking about all sorts of other cultural issues. And in fact, they might start tearing down the culture in order that they can focus on nothing but their own sexuality and who they want to have sex with. And that's strikingly similar to what we might see is, is possessing our society today. Yes, uh, no, Unwin 
Unwin made a lot of observations and recorded his observations, but he was also interested in the question, why does that society collapse? And his theory was kind of as you described, is that the sexual energy, if there are, is a culture that has restraints on that, that sexual energy has to be diverted to other more productive things. Or if it is not, it can become a major distraction away from being productive. And uh, I would say that, but he didn't know for sure. He just suggested this. But as you have observed, and, and I too have observed, that um, unbridled sexual constraints um, or unbridled sexuality can be a massive distraction in a person's life. For example, just the number of people in our society today who spend, let's say, two a minimum of two hours watching online porn uh, per week uh, in the evening when they're discretionary time. They have to work during the day, so they have to you know behave themselves and be productive. But our discretionary time has enormous potential to do things that are positive and constructive. But so much now of our discretionary time, it would be, well, for many people, many people, uh, a very significant percentage of society, there's different percentages I see, one is 75% uh, of men spend more than two hours watching illicit things online mm -hmm. or, and women are involved uh, at least 25%. And, but those percentages depend on the survey or the study, but it is an enormous distraction. But there's something that is also devastating about this. And I think it is even more devastating than simply uh, wasting time and energy on things that are not so productive in, in the area of sexuality. The devastation, I think, was outlined by Mary Eberstadt more recently when she looked at why is there such a massive increase of people who are struggling with mental health and what about the mass killing? She was in the United States. Mm. And uh, what about all this identity politics? And so she began to work backwards and she pinned it down to the sexual revolution. So something about increased sexual freedom has resulted in a massive deterioration in mental health amongst particularly the younger people who are more involved in this. And um, eventually, <clears throat> bottom line is, is that the sex, uh, loosening the sexual constraints decimates the family. Uh, mm -hmm. So for example, uh, absolute monogamy, as that deteriorates, uh, the children are left in single parent relationships, even blended family are better than single, but even blended family cannot, cannot um, reach the same level of well being with the children as uh, uh, children who grew up with the same dad and mom all their lives or all their growing up years. So just explain blended family to our, our listeners. Yeah, when let's say, uh, when absolute monogamy begins to break down and people move split apart and marry someone else, often the children are, are then uh, blended with the children of another, with the other spouse that's the second spouse mm -hmm. that's being that they're married to. But there's an identity that children uh, acquire from their siblings and from their uh, immediate extended family, cousins, aunts, uncles. And the sexual revolution really destroyed that larger identity that children get from an extended family because extended family meetings then become very awkward once a marriage has broken up. And so they tend not to happen near as much. The number of mm -hmm. cousins is greatly reduced because people, they break up after maybe one child or so. Mm -hmm. So, um, there is two factors involved in the destruction of a civilization. I think one of them is uh, the wasting of energy on the whole pursuit of se over sexualization of a society. And we're definitely, our culture is way over sexualized. Mm. And secondly, there are the consequences on the relationships in the family or the children uh, that grow up in a, in a state where absolute monogamy has been destroyed. I should mention uh, there were the, the three immediate consequences of crossing the tipping point. First of all, I should say I was shocked when I read that the tipping point was 
premarital sex. Yeah. I, I, like I, I had expected yeah. that the loosening of sexual constraints, the, the, you go pretty far down the road and then they really start bothering culture. But no, I was shocked because that's about the highest standard a culture. Yeah. If there's prenuptial chastity, the uh, chances of lifelong marital relationships is greatly increased, mm. greatly increased. Mm. And uh, so a and lot fi of people, figures, figures today support that. Yes. Oh, yeah, for sure. Mm. I mean, if, if you look at how long marriages last today and plot that with uh, the acceptance of premarital sexual relationships, yep. Uh, you'll see a direct correlation. Yep. And we had we had um, uh, Dr. Pat Fagan uh, interviewed recently, and uh, he was going through uh, the U.S. keeps some very good figures on those sorts of things, and and the indications are very clear. You know, mm -hmm. um, one sexual partner success in marriage it drops immediately as soon as you go above one sexual partner. Yeah, and people think that you know we can soar wild oats, so to speak. We can have a good time before marriage. But I have uh, my my career was uh, literally thousands of hours in talking with university students and mm. and even young married couples and so forth. And uh, those relationships that they had before they were married, you, they don't just get deleted. They don't the memories don't just delete. Mm. Those come into the marriage, and it has a huge effect. But for mm. there were three effects for that tipping point. One was I already mentioned the abandonment of absolute monogamy the one man one woman for life secondly uh, abandonment of belief in god <clears throat> no all cultures didn't just ne necessarily have a monotheistic belief but as they in increased in flourishing they at least had a deistic or a theistic belief hmm. belief in a god or gods that govern nature and was, were maybe active in human history and life well that belief in god went out the window once that tipping point was crossed and we see exactly the same thing today in our culture say in the last hundred years since the sexual revolution the belief in god has really declined now the third thing that went that, that was lost was rational thinking rational thinking like the ability to think logically and rationally and arrive at conclusions that are based on well-reasoned a well-reasoned process with propositions and a logical conclusion that gradually increased as the culture incorporated sexual restraint. But when the tipping point was crossed, there was a very rapid loss of rational thinking in that society. And again, being involved, heavily involved in the academic world, mm -hmm. uh, this, this began to become very visible even a couple, even shortly after um, premarital sexual relationships became totally accepted university many universities just are appalled at the lack of critical thinking skills that today's young people have in fact it's more important to today's people younger people to believe what they want to believe and mm -hmm. insist that's true versus anything to do with rational thinking and logical conclusions so those were the three victims mm -hmm. uh three signs that unwin said that a civilization has crossed the tipping point and is now on a decline. And we have seen those remarkably clear in our culture today since the sexual revolution. So it looks like Unwin's research is going to come true again today for mm -hmm. Western culture. In fact, it's not just Western culture anymore. The internet has connected us globally. So not all cultures are at the same place when it comes to sexual restraint. But when we look at the figures, let's say, for online pornography, um, there is a remarkable similarity between the cultures around the world. Even ones we would say are, are, are uh, officially of behind closed doors, they are rapidly plummeting in this area as well. Can we spend a moment exploring that a little bit through the, the, the lens of female emancipation as a... Uh as yes. Owen calls it, because he looks at these cultures and says, well, there's there's a pattern. So as the culture begins to get a little bit more liberal, um, you've got this idea of female emancipation, that that um, women want the same rights, quite rightly, as men. And mm -hmm. that that ends up turning into sexual emancipation, meaning that they can have or that they want to have sex with whoever they want to have sex with and not be restricted to one man. And 
Um, Unwin's recommendation there is actually it would be good to to um, have a society which is uh, absolutely monogamous, but where women have equal rights to men, because he sees that as as a potential um, solution. Yeah. And I wonder if he could maybe discuss that and also discuss that in the context of our society maybe being a little bit different to ones that have come before, because we have things like um, contraception uh, and we have things like uh, technology, which which does allow people to explore things on their own that they normally wouldn't have been able to. Yes, this was a, uh, a very, this was another observation Unwin made that just prior to the tipping point, what he observed in these various cultures, like we tend to think today that emancipation, let's say the uh, equal rights for men and women yeah. is a modern thing, but it's not. There were other cultures that had that as well. Uh, that where that arrived in Greek yeah. culture, for example, in Roman culture. But what he observed is that um, as something unfortunate, first of all, is that women tended to be treated often with not the same in not the same way as men. And that was unfortunate. And eventually a culture, as it began to flourish, reached a point where he, uh, the, uh, the emancipation of women occurred. Now, he used the term emancipation. Basically, what he meant is that the same rights that men had would be what women have as well, which mm. Unwin regarded as a good thing. And I, 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 I personally regard as a good thing. And I think many people intuitively think, well, that's, that's good. You know, mm. that's good with that. We, that we see this equal equality here, mm. but unfortunately what he also noticed is that when this occurred, uh, shortly afterwards, the sexual revolution occurred. And again, we saw that happen. The, the feminist movement began, well, actually began early 1900s. There's different stages that they've talked about, but it really reached the forefront in the mid 1960s in Western culture. And uh, very shortly, almost immediately after that, or even with it, began the sexual revolution. And what, why is this? Why is this? So Unwin thought, wouldn't it be somehow, somehow it would be great if we could have both the emancipation of women, but retain high sexual moral standards. He said, in that case, the flourishing would increase exponentially, the flourishing of a civilization, but that never occurred actually in every case. So what does that tell us? It tells us that uh, prior to that emancipation of women, because they were not treated equally, uh, there was a certain holdback uh, of sexual freedom in that the men, there was a huge double standard, in other words. So often mm. the men would be more free than the women. Mm. And the thing that restrained men, or there was a big restraint, was not just sexual rules, but the unavailability of women to participate sexually and freely, but that really disappeared, for example, in our culture with, with the uh, invention of contraceptives. Mm -hmm. uh, I would, so the question is, how can we have both? And, and I, I actually think there is a solution, and it would be that the, the moral values that we have when it comes to sexuality I think need to be intrinsically held, not externally imposed on ourselves. If they're externally imposed, there's a lot of people are very creative. There's a lot of cheating going on behind the scenes. But when they're intrinsically held by both the men and the woman, you can have both men and women treated completely equally with equal freedoms and rights, mm -hmm. but both of them hold an intrinsic high moral standard when it comes to um sexuality that is sexuality should be constrained within that union of marriage mm -hmm. for life and uh i i i mean i i i would not I, i've been married for 40 almost 42 years now and it, at, the older i get in in the the more i can look back and i could appreciate certain things that when i was young i didn't appreciate I have enormous value. Uh, I've seen the value of, of being committed to one another yeah. and only one another. Like just, it's a total, just that for life. That that provides a context of 
where love can flourish and provides a context where trust can absolutely flourish. I, neither of us ever have to worry, you know, wonder when somebody's on a road trip somewhere about what might be happening. There's absolute trust built, earned over the course of years. There's no baggage from our past that we brought into our marriage. So, um, and consequently, we have six children who have all, they're all grown up. They're all married now. And uh, they seem to be doing quite, mm-hmm. quite well. And uh, I think the ma- a big reason for that is that they were able to grow up within a loving relationship provided by their dad and mom, who, mm-hmm. first of all, loved each other and loved them. And it's just a beautiful context. And they watched that and they saw that. Yeah. In yeah. fact, I would say they, they learn more. They pick up more by watching mm. and seeing and living in that environment than by mm. me giving them a lecture on the, on the topic. I'm sure to a degree that that's, it is self-sacrificial in the sense that, you know, from a, from a humanist, animalistic perspective, you know, the temptation for sex wherever you can get it, you can see how people want it. But actually that sacrifice leads to something greater. And I know Unwin... Um, refers to uh, the, 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 the error of treating women as chattels, if you like, in society. And, and that's the thing that promotes the desire for emancipation quite rightly. But there's a degree to which I belong to my wife, just like you. I am hers. I'm not somebody else's. I am hers. And she is mine. And that any, uh, anything outside of that, there is an aspect of theft to because we belong to each other and that means something and that has implications down the line. Yeah, absolutely. Like, for example, you might notice I have a a sort of a bit of a stubble here. (laughs) Why do I have this stubble? I would much rather have a full beard. It's because my wife prefers me (laughs) like this. And, you know, I, as you said, I feel that Mm. I belong to her. You know, Mm. I mean, I, I want to please her. Mm. There is a sacrifice. I mean, it's not like, um, people are no longer notice other women or other men, but, um, I don't actually, I guess on the short term, it can seem like a sacrifice, Mm. especially if there's an opportunity to maybe experience something sexually that, um, normally might not be there. And it's very attractive. Mm. There's a short term attraction here. And it, it seems like a short, a sacrifice on the short term. But on the long term, there is enormous reward. At least Mm. I've experienced that in our own life. Enormous reward. The love just continues to flourish and grow when when that rather small sacrifice is made. Now, there's a lot of small sacrifices, you know, because there's a lot of times we may be attracted to or tempted in some way. But the long term payoff, there is no comparison. And it kind of, I, I know Carl Truman in, in his work, um, Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self and his, his latest book kind of summarizing that, he talks about the way um, our approach or, or the, the, the modern man or woman's approach to life has been, what do I want and what do I need as opposed to what's my role in society? So it's much more self-centered as opposed to I'm a member of society, how can I best contribute? But Picking up on a, a, another video you recently did with um, critiquing something that Sam Harris had put out. And Sam Harris in that video had said, um, Sam Harris, people who, who don't know, is uh, one of what you might call the new atheists, if you like. Um, but Sam Harris said, well, what's so bad about hell? It might be quite nice. And picking up on that thought, um, what's so bad about a collapsed society? It might be quite nice. Oh, <laughs> it's never nice, according to Unwin's research. What happens is, uh, okay, so first of all, in, he said it collapses within three generations of that society crossing the tipping point, which is when premarital sex becomes fine. There's no restrictions mm-hmm. on that. So there's three generations, which he r- roughly translates to one century or 100 years. The first generation after that tipping point is uh, there's very little change, actually, in the first generation. So our tipping point it's not a particular day on the calendar, probably not even a particular year, but for us, it was probably sometime, it started in the 19, mid-60s, but I would say that pre-nuptial 
sexual relationships didn't become perfectly fine and normal, maybe until the 1980s, somewhere in there. So the tipping point was somewhere in the 90s. So the first generation is roughly 33 years, and we're at the end of that now. And you will see not a whole lot of change normally in all the cultures they looked at because it's running on the momentum of the past. And still, there will be older people who still hold to a higher sexual moral standard than, say, the, the younger people. And so that has a stabilizing influence for the first generation. And then the older people start dying off and the younger people start becoming of age where they're having families and you enter the second generation and Unwin's research. So that's where you really start seeing a decline in hmm. rational thinking, lifetime monogamy and um, deism or theism or basically religion. See so decline in those three areas in the second generation. Hmm. Now, remarkably, we've seen that huge in the first generation already but i think it's because of the internet so the second generation starts to decline and by the time you hit the third generation so let's let's do some projections here uh roughly 30 years from now would be 20 let's say in the mid 2050s yep. we should enter the third generation at that point unwin says it goes into free fall now remember what he's valuing or measuring civilizations on it's in terms of flourishing agriculture, art, literature, uh, architecture, all those things rapidly decline in the third generation hmm. to the extent that the society either, there's a, it's just a complete compla collapse of how that society works, even in the production of food, of housing. Uh, usually at that point, you can either break out in a civil war where it's just big hmm. anarchy and it's every person for themselves, which is hmm. not fine or that culture is invaded by another culture that has higher sexual standards, higher, higher capabilities, greater flourishing, and it's at a higher stage in what he would call flourishing. Hmm. It's invaded. So we've seen that throughout history. Today, it's a little bit different because of a global maybe decline, although some cultures are still higher up than Western culture as far yep. as their yep. capabilities. So... But even then, they're they're declining too. So I don't know what it's going to look like. Probably something more akin to anarchy, uh, city states, um, civil wars, um, survival of the fittest. Yeah. It's it's never ever pleasant. How much of this, um, Kurt, do you think is the balance between natural slippage? Let's say so, as a liberal democracy kind of progresses. Uh, it wants to give more people freedom and what that does is end up restricting some people's freedom and saying well in order for some to be free this is what you now must believe and sorry but that's going to restrict your freedom um, and that's you could say that's that's um, almost like a natural slippage in liberal democracy and where it always tends to how much do you think is that and how much do you think is there's almost like an agenda being pushed by something or someone um, is it just natural slippage or is it more than that? Well, that's a very good question and a very good point you raise because uh, we are observing that as well in our, in our Western, Western culture and not just in Western culture. But, okay, so um, let's say as a society becomes more progressive, um, what tends to happen is that it wants to make people behave. So the, be, the, the incentive for behaving now becomes more and more external because people want more and more personal freedom to do whatever they want. So the laws have to be increased and you have to have more constraints on freedom. Uh, the kind of freedom that progressive society doesn't want to see, let's say freedom of speech, for example, has to be more tightly constrained. In so and you have to have a lot more laws to make people behave because they're not operating from an intrinsic moral standard anymore. For example, a friend of mine recently retired as a police officer. He had been a police officer for about 30 years. And he said that when he retired, he had approximately three times as many laws to enforce as he had 30 years earlier hmm. when he joined the police um, force that he worked for. Three times as many laws. And so we, we, we absolutely see that now. And that restricts our freedom. That, I mean, eventually... It becomes a gigantic daycare center, I suppose, where mm. 
there are strict rules about how everybody has to behave in order so we can get along. As opposed to uh, when everybody has a high internal intrinsic moral standard that includes, I really want to get along with my neighbor and do, you mentioned earlier, what are my moral obligations to other people, to my society? That's a high moral value when you mm -hmm. think of your life in terms of what are my moral obligations to other people. But as you pointed out, our society has swung away from that to what do I want? Mm -hmm. What are my rights? And as that happens, then because everybody has different ideas of what they want, what the rights are, then you have to have more government, more restraints, more rules, more laws to kind of kind of try and rein in the anar the personal anarchy that's happening. Mm -hmm. And that leads to a collapse of, of society as well. What, it can really lead to one of two ways. Mo a lot of the times, maybe even most of the time, it reaches a point where people just say enough of this mm -hmm. and you have a civil war. Or if you have a brutal government and North Korea is an example, and I've been there two times, I've seen it with my own eyes. If you have a brutal government, you can enforce the ultimate in a progressive society where it's all about, you know, let's all work together theoretically. And here are all the rules to make sure that everybody behaves. And it becomes absolute, it's like living in a penitentiary, yep. really, in, yep. in a prison. Our government, uh, and I'm not talking about uh, necessarily political parties, but our governments uh, in Canada and in the UK, generally they're not comprised of completely silly people, but people with knowledge and understanding who realise the significance to a society, to a stable society of, um, of real marriage, of one man, one woman, monogamous marriage. Why is it being abandoned? I mean, they know what they're doing. What's going on? First of all, I th there are some, like I'm thinking of Canada here. I know Canada politicians better. There are some who personally in their own life, they, they seem to believe that absolute monogamy is the way to go. But in the kind of legislation they introduce, it's totally contradictory to what they do. And I think mm. a lot of it has to do to at least two things. One, one is, is a cultural brainwashing, let's say a culture led mentality where we want to fit in with our culture, our culture seems to be going in a particular direction. Mm. And um, it can influence a person. We're influenced by our culture every day. We actually have to work. I have to work and intentionally evaluate, why do I think of these things? Why do I believe what I believe? Mm. And the second thing that happens is that goes along. Okay, that influences the academic world. And right now, I would say the academic world is almost front and center in leading the charge into the complete collapse of our civilization yep, much so. with the things that they're doing. Mm -hmm. But the second thing that happens is that um, the politician, even if they believe in, say, maybe a higher moral standard, is heavily influenced by the polls and by the temptation to want to get elected in the next term. And so consequently, they are pressured by the culture to uh, draft certain laws, bring certain things into effect. And often that culture, if it's on the decline, that pressure is negative on the moral values of a politician mm -hmm. or a government mm -hmm. leader. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's just two possibilities there. That second one is a tough one. I don't know how many times I've referred to this, but in um, 2018 here in the UK, there was a, a Comres uh, anonymous poll of, of our politicians and of those who responded over half said they were too fearful to speak their mind uh, mm -hmm. on certain LGBT issues for fear of backlash. Yeah. And you think, yeah. hold on, if our lawmakers are too afraid to speak and presumably vote with their true feelings, well, that's a problem. That's a oh, significant it problem. It's a significant, it's kind of like um, an unofficial coercion or restriction of, mm. of the free discussion of ideas. Mm. Like mm. I can, I can, um, Personally, I'm not going to stand up and say hateful things about people. I want to build bridges with people. Yep. But I also want the freedom to have a, a, a sincere, thoughtful discussion on any issue, any mm. issue at all. Mm. But as you say, the same situation is here in Canada. Polls have been done in universities here. And most, the vast majority of university students are afraid to say anything in class mm. for fear they somehow cross a line. Mm. and get disciplined or expelled or or reprimanded mm. Mm. so there's this fear 
And, and living in a culture of fear is another sign, I think, that we're on a, on a heading towards a collapse of civilization that Unwin forecast. Now, mm -hmm. I should point out that Unwin observed that many of these cultures and civilizations thought they would be the exception. He said this was <laughs> Hubert, mm -hmm. like he, he just observed this. And he says, no, there were no exceptions. Mm -hmm. A lot of cultures thought they would be it. And I know our culture probably thinks the same thing, that, oh, we won't collapse. Although, I don't know. I, I see a lot of pessimism, especially amongst the younger people, yeah. that they're not sure the future is looking all that rosy. And they're worried about it. And I think rightfully so, because there are larger things that are slowly grinding to a halt that should yeah. go into free fall. You're right. And not only that, but you look at the, the global population and what you might call the Western world is about two billion people out of seven billion people. So we're not in the not in the majority. You know, no. there's there's a lot more people who think and feel uh, culturally very different to us. Exactly. So we need yeah, to protect fact, and preserve that. We do. I know. Uh, in fact, I see uh, like here I hear a lot about how uh, I hear a lot about colonialism and how terrible it is because North America, of course, was colonized by the British and the French. Mm -hmm. And but um, and so they, the, the, lab, the liberal left or the progressives would say, uh, you know, oh, the colonialism is terrible. But what I am observing is that when they're looking at some of these other cultures in developing countries that maybe have more conservative moral values with regard to sexuality, they actually think they're wrong. They actually want to, it, uh, let's say, practice a, a cultural colonialism on the developing world and convince the developing world they need a mm -hmm. sexual revolution, revolution mm -hmm. as well, that they're, they're backward and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it's a large double standard in our Western culture that we think our views of sexuality and sexual freedom are the proper ones or the correct ones. And we need to basically colonize the rest of the world yeah, with our yeah. ideas. This, this concept of uh, liberal hegemony, you know, taking yeah. our views and, and liberalism and almost like imposing it on other, <laughs> other countries because we know it's better. Um, can I just touch, I, I know you, you're, you're a busy guy and I could, I could literally spend the entire day talking to you, uh -oh. um, but a little bit of criticism of um, Unwin. In fairness, we need to look at those who, and the criticisms will, will involve things like, yeah, but um, correlation is not causation. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, actually, uh, if Unwin had looked at Japan, for example, he would see that Japan has become a, a lot more liberal over the years and that its liberalism has coincided with its prosperity. So how would we deal with things like that? Yes. Well, first of all, it is true that correlation is not necessarily causation. And uh, I do mention some my own reservation of that in my article that although I think there is something to be said for sexual energy and diverting that into something more constructive, hmm. I wasn't sure that that was the cause of the collapse of civilizations. But when I read about the effect of the sexual revolution on the family and on marriage, mm. I think we're much closer to the cause of that mm. collapse. Mm. Unwin, of course, so, wasn't, didn't have a faith himself, did he? He was. Uh... I, don't, I don't see any evidence yeah. whatsoever. In yeah. fact, when I read his book, looking for that, um, I, I saw the way he described, say, Christianity, for example, was um i don't think he ever mentions jesus for example he does mm. talk about christianity mm. but he, i think he refers to it uh, mm. uh the, mm. the galilean as a term that he used the galilean mm. he never uses mm. and he refers to christianity in a very um just completely as if it's no different from any other religions pagan mm. or otherwise mm. so mm. i i would suspect uh based on my reading of unwin that he was probably maybe an agnostic maybe an atheist, but mm. certainly no evidence whatsoever that he was a religious man, mm. because you would expect religious people to be biased up here. Mm. But he, he just doesn't seem to have that at all. If anything, maybe biased against mm. slightly, slightly against, I wouldn't say a bias, but just yep. and, and so, of those of those who do criticize, you know, they, they pick up and say, well, his definition of civilized versus uncivilized, you know, that's not right. But they don't actually undermine his basic premises which is which is once you lose that notion of lifelong monogamy um and and keeping sex for marriage yeah. that's the beginning of the end for any culture it is yeah, yeah. because yeah. of the consequences that unfold from that 
So um, I'm um, I was I was once um, criticised as being a pathological optimist, which which I took as a compliment, <laughs> as a pathological optimist would, of course. Um, so I'm not I'm not willing to think this is the end of our society and this is the end of our culture. And many people have said actually we're we're due a massive correction at some point, and and that could be painful if not managed properly. I wonder, in your view, how do we look at you know, you can never go back in time. Of course you can't. But in terms of, uh, and I don't think anyone's looking for top-down imposition of, of these things to, to get back to where we need to be. What's the route forward from here, would you say? Well, I'll just give you my thoughts on that. And that is a, a very important, that question you've asked. I think, um, okay, let's say if we want to be an optimist here, the way forward for me personally is uh, I think intrinsic moral values are very important. Well, I don't want imposition of moral values like what they have in North Korea, for example, which is the extreme. It has to be intrinsic. So what is that? I, I think that I might not be able to do a whole lot about the where our civilization is going, but what I can do is, first of all, look to myself. How am I doing personally? Hmm. And for example, the emancipation of women, I thought, like, how is that working out in my marriage? I very much, I totally see my wife as my number one advisor, for example. Hmm. I, I don't think I've ever made, well, I've never, say, pulled rank as a husband, say, well, I'm the man, you know, I'm gonna, we're going to do this ever in 40 one years of marriage hmm. we talk about these things and if i ever did that i would see that as a failure on my part hmm. a loss and consequently the the relationship between a man and a woman when they see each other as their number one advisors and confidence and partners that's the first step i think in producing the next generation that will not be going downhill, but also will uh, those values that they'll hold. So that's one step. The second thing is, well, at least maybe I can somehow influence others to maybe think a little more carefully about their own um, intrinsic state of affairs, their intrinsic values. And so uh, that's why I have my website, for example, kirkdurston.com. That's why I'm doing my videos. It's, it's the, the hope that I can motivate others. And mm -hmm. so even though Hunman's research said there were no exceptions in the collapse, that doesn't mean I throw up my hands at the spirit and say, oh, okay, I'm just, we're, we're going downhill. No, I think we have a moral obligation, every one of us, mm -hmm. to first of all, look to ourselves. What are my obligations to my society? Personally, I'm not interested in my rights and freedoms. Well, I, I let me let me say that. I'm not interested in my my rights freedoms is a different category i'm very interested in that but rights i think um I'll, I'll say i'll trust god to look out for my rights what i have to do is to look at myself as basically a servant to my civilization yep. and to the people around me my neighbors and so it's it's about looking around me and see what positive contribution can i make at, coming out of my intrinsic love for what is right and good and beautiful and true that's you know kirk that is absolutely beautiful and that's something we need to get back into our culture is that it's not just about you and and the best way of of producing the best environment for you is for you to think about other people and yes. if everyone did that sounds a bit twee but actually things might be an awful lot be better than they are now and oh, I... that that's never more embraced than in in the you know the, the marriage relationship uh, the context of, of sex within marriage, all those things that Unwin says are absolutely essential to a, a prospering, flourishing culture. Well, mm -hmm. Kirk, it's been a, a privilege. You mentioned your website, uh, kirkdurston.org, was it? Dot com, kirkdurston.com. That's Kirk yeah. as in the Scottish word for church, Kirk. Yep. Durston, D-U-R-S-T-O-N. And we'll, po we'll pop it on the screen. Uh, can I recommend this uh, This video will be going out to, or we'll be notifying uh, tens of thousands of people. I want them to all, if they can, go to your website, have a look, uh, go and watch your videos, but most of all, to take your advice, which is let's be examples to society. Let's encourage mm -hmm. others to do it too. And let's get it back and let's make it uh, the society that it could and should be based on real marriage and the value that that gives. Kirk, mm -hmm. thank you so much for your time. I wish you well in all your work as you're going forward and uh, 
It's a pleasure to talk to you. Oh, it was a pleasure as well, Tony. Thank you for this excellent conversation.